not yet have responded to your call for salvation. That today would be the day. That this Easter Sunday would be the time that they were born again and that they would come into your family. Lord, we ask for all of those who are in need today, who have hurts and struggles and difficulties, we pray, Lord God, that you would be the answer to those things, that you would help them see the way and find that in you. Lord, for those of us today who uh, are just overwhelmed with the blessings of life, we pray, Lord, that you would hear our prayer of gratitude and thanksgiving and ask that you would guide this nation to a place of spiritual awakening and revival in the church while there's yet time. Lord, we would thank you for all of these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Sue. <laughs>
Father, we, uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time and this opportunity we have to gather in your house. And Lord, we know that as you look down upon those that are gathered this morning, some uh, came with many trials and hardships, Father, that had a desire to be in your house. And Father, some, some of us came, Lord, because that's what we do on Sunday. Lord, there are those here that came uh, maybe prompting by another family member, maybe visiting from out of town, or whatever the reason for it. Uh, you look down upon us and you know our hearts. And Father, for a great God like you to, to get us here to assemble, Lord, we pray that you would just clear our minds and our hearts, and no matter the reason that we came this morning, Father, that your spirit would speak through our spirit. Lord, that we would be attentive as Brother David comes to share your word, that we would have ears that can hear, Lord, and we would listen to what you say. Father, we are mindful of those that are not here today for whatever reason of travel or sickness. Father, uh, some, Lord, uh, may be coming today with out of love for one for the first time in the sea Lord, we just pray that your spirit will be with you. And Lord, we do ask that, that our thoughts would all be upon you, the things that we think, the things that we say, the things that we have lifted up to you as long as uh, worship that is on you. And Lord, we'd ask that uh, you just put a hedge of protection around this place. Help us to be mindful of just what it is you would have us to do this day. It's these things we ask in your Son, in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's so good to see you all here today to come and worship the Lord. Sing praises to his name to acknowledge the great things that he has done. Uh, I hope that some of you had the opportunity to go and see the movie, The Case for Christ, this week. As showing in Beaumont, I'm not sure for how long. It's a wonderful film about the life of Lee Strobel. Uh, Lee Strobel is uh, one of those guys that was out to prove that Jesus was merely a man just a religious teacher. He was not the Son of God. There was nothing really unusual about him except possibly he was a, a wise teacher or something of that sort. And as a reporter, he chose to investigate it just like he would any other investigative story about mafia or just anything. He began to look into it. He's just one of many people who have come to faith in Christ as a result of such a careful study. C.S. Lewis is another, and there are many others uh, throughout the ages who have attempted to disprove the reality of Jesus as the Son of God, as the sinless Son of God, as the sacrifice for our sins, as one who lived, died, was buried, and rose again, and lives forevermore. And so in this process today, uh, as we talk about some of the things, I want to show you a scripture passage, and we'll get to it moment that points to this very significant thing very, very early in the life of the church. Now, when you look at that, you see the four events that are generally recognized as a part of the Holy Week. Uh, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem and people acknowledge that He is Messiah, they lay the branches in front of Him, they fulfill the prophecy. As you see the suffering that Jesus went through before his crucifixion and the things that he suffered and the prophecy in Old Testament that said he would be a suffering servant, uh, that he wasn't coming the first time as a mighty warrior uh, on a, a white horse and going to destroy the Romans and restore everything to Israel, that he was going to come and suffer for his people and then the actual crucifixion in which it is uh, understood that he 
literally, physically died on the cross, was buried, didn't rest there for a while until he got better, and all of the things that go with that, and then, of course, the resurrection. Well, there are witnesses to all of these events, and these witnesses are at the triumphal entry, uh, they're at his suffering at the mock trials, they're witnesses to his crucifixion and death, uh, to his burial, to his resurrection, uh, and the oldest account, if you were going to guess today, you were looking in your New Testament, what is the oldest account of these events? Would you guess Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? How about 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians is the oldest book in the New Testament in terms of closest to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The Gospel writers carried that information around in verbal form for a long time before God inspired anyone to sit down and write it. And so our oldest creedal understanding of what the gospel message is comes from 1 Corinthians 15. Now, as people look at this idea of the resurrection, they struggle with it. Oh, they say, look, you know, this part of it is true, but this part isn't. And, and this part of it is true, but this part couldn't be. And I want you to realize that many of the books that have been written in the last 10 years are, are taking these various angles as you uh, think about how they're trying to explain away the resurrection. But sometimes not really trying to explain away the resurrection so much, but the implications of it. You know what I'm saying? If Jesus really did come back from the dead, then everything he taught and everything he said has been acknowledged by God to be worthy and true and right and cannot be ignored. Because who else has he uh, acknowledged by bringing them back from dead? Some of the books insist that Jesus never really died. And so here's a, a group of people who really don't have faith in Christ and so they're insisting that Jesus never really died. Here's another group of people that are insisting that Jesus certainly died and his body must have been moved. Can you have it both ways? No, you can't.